Holy Spirit. Faith, hope, and love abide. And so every soul is blessed and made whole. The truth in our hearts is our guide. We are answering the call of love. Hands joined together as hearts beat as one. Emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim we are answering Sometimes we build a barrier to keep love tightly bound, corrupted by fear, unwilling to hear, denying the beauty we found. We are answering the call of love. joined together as hearts beat as one emboldened by faith we dare to proclaim we are answering the call of love a bright new day is dawning when love will not divide Reflections of grace in every embrace, fulfilling the vision divine. We are answering the call of love. Hands joined together as hearts beat as one, emboldened by faith. We dare to proclaim, we are answering the call of love. We are answering the call of love. Welcome to the virtual sanctuary of Neshoba Unitarian Universalist Church. I am Sarah Osborne, the Director of Religious Exploration and Seminary Student. I am so glad you are able to join us this morning for this online service. It is good to be together in spirit. Our opening prayer comes to us from Lynn Cox. Spirit of life, ancestors of the stars and the sun, you who embrace the vastness of space and us along with it, be with us today, hold us in our worry, our exhaustion, our grief. Keep us close as we sit with our truth, whatever that may be. Lead us to rest in the quiet, to find solace and renewal in this time of shifting light and dark. You whose arms open with the spinning galaxies, help us to make room as you do for all that is. Open our hearts to our loved ones, our neighbors, the beings with whom we share this planet. Lead us to reach out to others in compassion Turn us toward one another in mercy, right relationship, and reconciliation. You who have seen the rising and setting of the suns, of seasons, of civilizations, remind us of all that we have learned from the history of the world and from our own histories. Give us the courage to face our mistakes and to repair them whenever possible. Help us understand our interdependence, 
our gravitational relatedness with all of the other spinning lives around us and lead us to treat those relationships with care. In this virtual space filled with the people among us who shine like stars, this space filled with the sparkle of love and care, we give thanks for this moment to be together. May our senses be open to the beauty of this day this season, this world. Amen. Hey, everybody. Today for Chalice Lighting, I'm going to be reading from the book Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Uh, I love the author, Jonathan Safran Foer. Um, and in this book, it's a story about the relationship between a father and his child. The dad in this story doesn't really know his father, and so they never had a great relationship, but he has an incredible one with his young son. The passage I'm going to read today gives us a glimpse into the relationship between that dad and son. For those of you who have a great relationship and great memories of your father, today I hope that you remember those and I hope that you are filled with light at all the great parts of that relationship that you had. For others of us, uh, we didn't have quite a great relationship with our fathers. For me, I like to challenge myself to think about not what wasn't, uh, but what should be. And in my own life when I do this, it gives me hope that I can be the dad I want to be. And then at the same time to celebrate that in this world, there are a Googleplex of great fathers. Dad always used to tuck me in and he'd tell the greatest stories, and we'd read the New York Times together, and sometimes he'd whistle I Am the Walrus because that was his favorite song, even though he couldn't explain what it meant, which frustrated me. One thing that was so great was how he could find a mistake in every single article we looked at. Sometimes they were grammar mistakes, sometimes they were mistakes with geography or facts, and sometimes the article just didn't tell the whole story. I loved having a dad who was smarter than the New York Times. And I loved how my cheek could feel the hairs on his chest through his t-shirt and how he always smelled like shaving, even at the end of the day. Being with him made my brain quiet. I didn't have to invent a thing. I turned on my shortwave radio and with dad's help, I was able to pick up someone speaking Greek, which was nice. We couldn't understand what he was saying, but we lay there looking at the glow in the dark constellations on my ceiling and listened for a while. Dad? Yeah? Could you tell me a story? Sure. A good one? As opposed to all the boring ones I tell? Right. I tucked my body incredibly close into his, so my nose pushed into his armpit. And you won't interrupt me? I'll try not to. Because it makes it hard to tell a story. And it's annoying. And it's annoying. The moment before he started was my favorite moment. Once upon a time, New York City had a sixth borough. What's a borough? That's what I call an interruption. I know, but the story won't make any sense to me if I don't know what a borough is. It's like a neighborhood or a collection of neighborhoods. So if there was once a sixth borough, then what are the five boroughs? Manhattan, obviously, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx. Have I ever been to any of the other boroughs? Here we go. I just want to know. We went to the Bronx Zoo once a few years ago. Remember that? No. And we've been to Brooklyn to see the roses at the Botanic Garden. Have I been to Queens? I don't think so. Have I been to Staten Island? No. Was there really a sixth borough? I've been trying to tell you. No more interruptions, I promise. When the story finished, we turned the radio back on and found someone speaking French. That was especially nice because it reminded me of the vacation we just came back from, which I wished never ended. After a while, Dad asked me if I was awake. I told him no, because I knew that he didn't like to leave until I had fallen asleep, and I didn't want him to be tired for work in the morning. He kissed my forehead and said goodnight. Now, if you'll join me in saying our affirmation of covenant. 
Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. Today I want to tell you a little bit about our fifth principle, which is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. What that means is that everybody has the right to vote for what they believe in. And that's true these days in America, but it was not always that way. A hundred years ago this summer, women finally got the right to vote across the whole country. Um, it was the 19th Amendment and it was passed um, by Congress approving it and then two thirds of the states approving it. And Tennessee was the last one of the two thirds that they needed. So we were the deciding vote to make it the law that women could vote in elections. And so I wanna read you a story today about um, one of the people who was very much involved in getting that right passed. Um, this is from a collection called What If Nobody Forgave? It's a collection of UU stories that focus on our principles. So this one, of course, is about the fifth principle. The story is called Susan Goes to Work. 100 years ago in America, women were not allowed to do many of the things that men could. They could not even vote for the president of the country. One woman, Susan B. Anthony, thought that women should have the same rights as men. She worked hard to change the laws and eventually became famous as an important activist for women's rights. But when Susan was 12 years old, no one knew that she would go down in history. Her family only knew that she asked a lot of questions. When Susan was a little girl, her father, Daniel Anthony, owned a cotton mill in Adams, Massachusetts, where his employees turned cotton into thread and cloth. One day, a young woman worker became sick and her doctor told her to stay home for two weeks. Susan and her sister, 14-year-old Guelma, wanted to take her place, but Susan's mother said no. Please, mother, begged Susan. Absolutely not, said mother. Why not, asked Susan. Susan was a thoughtful, observant younger, youngster who was always questioning things that didn't make sense to her. Why did her teacher refuse to give her lessons on long division when boys her age were learning how to do it? Why were wives and children treated like men's property? Why couldn't women have their own money or belongings? Why didn't her father seem to notice her mother's labor, which included not only raising six children, but also cooking, sewing, washing, and ironing for the 11 mill workers who lived in the Anthony home? What was a mother supposed to do if her husband spent all his wages on himself and she wasn't allowed to get a job to support her children? Did women have to be wives and mothers? Why couldn't a woman with more experience in the mill supervise new workers who were men? Why didn't her mother want her or Roma to take over for the sick worker? It isn't proper for you to go to work, Mrs. Anthony argued. Our family isn't poor and you will always have a man to take care of you, your father, your brother, your husband. But Mr. Anthony thought his daughters could learn something at the mill. Finally, Mrs. Anthony agreed to let one of the girls go. They drew straws for the opportunity. Susan won. Susan's job was to be a spooler, to keep an eye on the spools or bobbins that held the newly spun thread. When a spool became full of thread, she had to remove it from the still spinning machine and quickly replace it with an empty one. The work was not particularly hard or dangerous, but Susan had to be on the job six days a week, 12 hours a day. When the two weeks were over, Mr. Anthony had a right to Susan's pay. Instead, he told her she could have it as long as she split it with Guelma, who had done Susan's household chores while Susan was working at the mill. Susan's mother probably thought Susan's working career was over, but Susan had other ideas. Beginning at age 15, she took several teaching jobs. After continuing her own education, she became a girl's headmistress or principal at a boarding school in Kanadorhari, New York. Where she, when she was 26. By the time she left the job, she was praised to be the smartest woman that was now or ever in Kona Johari. 
Susan wanted to do more than simply earn her own living. She sought changes that would give everyone the freedom, opportunities, and privileges that only white men were granted at the time. She joined with others to end slavery. Her major life's work was on behalf of women's suffrage, that is, the right to vote in elections. Susan spent more than 50 years traveling around the country, organizing meetings, writing and giving speeches, and raising money for the cause. Because voting would give women a say in making and changing laws, Susan believed it was the most effective thing a woman could do to change her life for the better. It is beyond a doubt that before long, women will be sent to Congress as representatives by some of the states, Susan said in 1900. Indeed, it is not at all beyond the bounds of possibility that a woman may be elected president someday. By that time, Susan's mother would have been astounded to see woman, women working in a great many different occupations. In 1900, there were two veterinarians, four train engineers, 22 architects, 59 blacksmiths, 129 butchers, 208 lawyers, 219 coal miners, 337 dentists, 1,235 ministers, and 4,555 doctors who were women. Susan never got the chance to vote. She died 14 years before 1920, the year in which all women received that right. Susan had trained other women to carry on her work. She firmly believed that when people join with others and devote their lives to a worthy cause, failure is impossible. So when you are thinking about impossible tasks, just remember that you can join with other people and work towards goals that you think are important and maybe you'll make the next big change. Walter Brugman once said, the prophetic tasks of the church are to tell the truth in a society that lives in illusion, grieve in a society that practices denial, and express hope in a society that lives in despair. For the prophetic tasks and mission of this church, your act of generosity will sustain these efforts. Please give as you are able, utilizing the methods on the following graphic, and please know how very grateful we are for your gifts, no matter the size.
Our reading this morning comes from Manx Fairy Tales by Sophia Morrison. It is entitled The Boyhood of Lou. Long centuries ago, when Mananan MacLear was ruling in Man, and when his court was famous all over the world for brave warriors and wise men, Lou of the Long Arm was sent over from Erin to be brought up there. Lou was the son of Cian, a great lord of the Danon, the people that had the power in Erin in those days. Mananan had him trained with his own sons in the use of arms, and he learned to hunt and to fish, to run and to swim. He grew tall and strong and braver than any young man of his time. He and the sons of Mananan led a joyous and free outdoor life in the wild places of the island. There were forests in man then, alive with game. There were lakes and rivers full of fish and curaws swimming with waterfowl. So they hunted the red deer and the fierce purr in the green woods and the cruel wolf on the mountains. They often put to sea in Manannan's magic boat, Wave Sweeper, which carried them wherever they wished, without sail or oars. And so the time wore on. The home of Manannan was not in the island itself, but in the rocky gray islet lying off the spur of Peel Hill. When the sun was shining on the summer sea, the islet sparkled like a jewel on the clear green water. When the sunset was blazing behind it and the red cliffs across the bay were flowing with color, it seemed to float like a cloud in the radiance of crimson and gold. Around it, the white gulls rested on the water as if they were asleep or circled round it on flashing wings. At all times, the home of Mananan was fairer than the words can tell. At the fall of day, when the men gathered together by the turf fire on the wide hearth, the roar of the sea was always in their ears. Here, they listened to the bards chanting their tales to the sound of the harp, and they taught Lou to be a great harpist. He had three wonderful tunes, the laughing tune, the sleeping tune, and the weeping tune, which made those that listened laugh or sleep or weep as he wished. He was taught to write in Agam's too, and the rules of poetry. One night, Mananan, looking out of his kingdom, saw how the Fomorians were warring against the people of Dana and making themselves master over them. So he determined to send to their aid his foster son, Lou. He called to Lou saying, go to the rescue of thy people. We can teach you nothing more, but these Fomorians are fierce and cruel and I will send you against them prepared as one of your rank should be. So Lou was sent away with splendid gifts. He wore Mananan's coat, wearing which he could not be wounded, and also his breastplate, which no weapon could pierce. His helmet had two precious stones set in the front and one behind, which flashed as he moved. And Mananan girded him for the fight with his own sword, the Answerer, which those who were opposed to it in battle were so terrified that their strength left them. He rode Mananan's horse, Enbar, of the flowing mane, which could travel over land or sea as swiftly as the wind. His foster brothers and Mananan's fairy cavalcade went with him, and away he traveled westward over the stormy sea to Erin. As he went, he looked back at the green hills of Mananan's island, and he saw his foster father's noble figure standing on the beach. Mananan was wrapped in his magic cloak of colors, changing like the sun from blue-green to silver and again to the purple of evening. 
he waved his hand to Lou and cried, Victory and blessings with thee. So Lou, glorious in his youth and strength, left his island home. The mythology of Lou tells us that he goes on to be quite the god amongst the Celtic peoples, a multi-talented artisan, crafter, warrior, and champion. In fact, Lou gets his own holiday in the Wiccan calendar called Lunasa, which is a harvest festival. From the legend, we see that Lou was raised in the company of foster brothers and in community with many skilled folks. But would Lou have achieved his greatness without them or the care of his foster father, Mananan? Mananan takes Lou into his family. He offers a childhood of exploration and freedom as Mananan sees the growing strife in the world around him, he gives Lou the tools he needs to face the challenge. When Lou is nearly grown, Mananan sends him out equipped with his best offerings. Mananan could have led the charge himself, but he recognized that it was Lou's time to lead. And as Lou makes his leave, Mananan gives his blessings. Mananan represents the best of what a parent or elder can be. Today, on the longest day of the year, we celebrate Father's Day. We recognize the many great dads and papas, fathers, foster fathers, stepdads, daddies, maddies, uncles, grandpas, and beloved cousins who do the hard work of raising the next generation. But this is also a complicated day for many who may not have the Mananan type figure in their lives. I honor the hurt frustration and disappointment many among us have felt toward their parents or lack thereof. So much imperfection exists. And yet, that does not mean we cannot have that role fulfilled in other ways. What does it mean to father? I don't believe this word is limited to the cis male gender. In my humble opinion, fathering means being a provider, an encourager, a challenger, a caretaker, a protector. Fathering offers stability and comfort and support. Fathering even means making dad jokes, a term that refers to those terribly funny moments meant to cheer someone up that often land flat, but get points for the effort. I know many among us that fit the fathering bill. YouTuber Rob Kenny grew up without a father figure in his life, so he decided to help folks like him by starting a channel called Dad How Do I? that became a huge sensation. His videos offer practical, what he calls dad vice, and people are flocking to his videos, which cover such simple things like how to change a tire or how to tie a tie or how to shave. The comments section are full of immense gratitude for his simple, Mr. Rogers-like instruction. And Kenny was overwhelmed by the response to his videos and has gone on to offer more heavy content like videos entitled, I'm so proud of you, which encourages his kids to leave their comfort zones and take risks. 
while we celebrate and take comfort in these stories like Kenny, there is a more somber side of Father's Day which must be remembered. The black fathers whose lives have been cut short by the brutality of police and the evils of white supremacy culture. Not only must we say their names in remembrance, but we must take up the mantle of fathering by saying no more harm must come to the lives of black men and people and other marginalized folks. One of the most important features of parenting is knowing when to say that we are wrong and to actively work to make it better. For those of us who identify as white, we must listen and learn we need to provide for the Black Lives Movement. Demanding change in our society, we must confront our own white supremacy and patriarchy and protect those on the front lines working for change. This is all our struggle. George Floyd leaves behind a six-year-old daughter, Gianna. Gianna's mother, Roxy Washington, spoke during a press conference where she made an emotional plea for people to remember that Floyd was a good father. Gianna does not have a father, she said. He will never see her grow up or graduate. He will never walk her down the aisle. If there is a problem she's having and she needs a dad, she does not have that anymore. In an article on the Grio, Stephen Jackson, former professional basketball player, vows to keep Floyd's life lifted and be there for Floyd's little girl. In the same article, Floyd's daughter Gianna is pictured sitting on the shoulders of Jackson and is quoted as saying, Daddy changed the world. Let Gianna's words not be in vain. The sun always rises and tomorrow we begin again. Let us father in a new way of being. Let us as a community and as individuals support a better world. A world that gives every child the freedom and exploration Lou experienced. Let us work to equip every child with the resources they need to live into their full potential. Let us recognize when it is time for us to step back and follow the lead of younger generations. Let Black Lives Matter. For all those who nurture, for those who stepped up, for those that are no longer here, for those who never were, and for those who are yet to be, we hold you in our collective embrace. Victory and blessings with thee. Will you please join me for a moment of reflection and meditation with these words by Audette Fulbright Folson. Did you rise this morning broken and hung over with weariness and pain and rage tattered from waving too long in a brutal wind? Get up, child. Pull your bones up right. Gather your skin and muscle into a patch of sun. Draw a breath deep into your lungs. You will need it for another day calls to you. I know you ache. I know you wish the work were done and you with everyone you have ever loved were on a distant shore, safe and unafraid. But remember this. Tired as you are, you are not alone. Here and here and here also, there are others weeping and rising and gathering their courage. 
you belong to them and they to you. And together, we will break through and bend the arc of justice all the way down into our lives. Until we are together again, be at peace, create joy, and know love. Blessed be, and amen. Well, hello again. It's Bill coming to you from my kitchen. I was just trying to wrangle uh, our cat, Fuzzy, to get him in my lap for a, a short appearance. He wouldn't cooperate, and that's kind of par for the course. I wanted to get Fuzzy in the picture because it's gotten clear to me that of the several of these recaps I've done, these video recaps, the highlight so far has been um, the cat's three-second cameo appearance a few weeks back. Uh, maybe one of these days I'll get him uh, to co-star with me, but so far it's been all uh, creative differences with Fuzzy. Meanwhile, I want to recap the most recent meeting of uh, the board of our church. We Zoomed together again on June the 16th. The secretary will prepare the official meeting minutes for approval at the July meeting. But in the meantime, here's an informal recap of what happened. In the president's opening remarks, Dale noted that our first ever congregational Zoom meeting went really well. Um, I think it's fair to say that everyone on the board um, was a little apprehensive about conducting that uh, required and important meeting via Zoom. Um, but it's my sense that everyone on the board was pleased and relieved that the technology worked as well as it did uh, and that we had over 40 voting members in attendance for that meeting. 
Before our board meeting, uh, as usual, the board got written reports from the minister, the finance committee, the treasurer, and the building and grounds committee. Reverend Beth summarized and supplemented her report. Then we got a full verbal report from DRE Sarah. As for the connection team, uh, the, the C team, Dale reported that, among other things, that committee has given thought to guidelines for church groups that want to meet in person um, at Neshoba. In brief, those guidelines, which the board endorsed, are small groups, 10 or fewer, socially distanced, and no use of the building at all other than for the restrooms. I want to briefly circle back to Reverend Beth's report. As usual, much of her work since the last board meeting involved uh, pastoral care for our members. Beth conveyed a, a note of hope and optimism that I think is worth highlighting. There are always some in our beloved community who need pastoral care. And that's certainly true in hard times. But on the whole, Beth's sense is that we are coping well, by and large. And I think, as I said, that is a note of optimism that's worth passing along. The board had no unfinished business on our agenda, so we turned to four items of new business. First, the board authorized the church treasurer to apply for forgiveness of the $14,000 loan that Neshoba got under the Federal Payroll Protection Program. July, this coming July, is the time to make that application, and there's every reason to think that it will be routinely granted, uh, relieving us of the obligation to return that money. Secondly, the board approved an $870 expense for repair and maintenance of the fire alarm system. I want to mention that, of course, that was a building and grounds committee suggestion. Even though we are not meeting in our building, and the building is mostly empty these days, uh, the tasks that fall to the Building and Grounds Committee are about the same as always, and those folks are up there at the church frequently making sure that everything is uh, ship-shape and in, in, uh, in good care. I want to commend them for their ongoing efforts. The third item of new business um, was a routine housekeeping matter. The board renewed the housing allowance designation that we attach to a portion of Reverend Beth's compensation. We do this periodically to ensure that she gets the advantageous tax treatment that she's entitled to get. And finally, the board approved the minutes of our just completed congregational meeting. Our ever-diligent secretary, Kathy, drafted those minutes right after last Sunday's meeting, and she had them ready for our review um, and, and approval on Tuesday. That was it for official actions taken and, and matters discussed at the meeting. We spent the rest of our time um, reiterating thank yous to the four departing board members. Those are Dale Cost, Tom Brimmer, Scott Osborne, and Sarah, I've yet to crash my e-bike, Ralston. By the way, all of our new board members who take office next month were in attendance at this month's meeting, clearly eager to get a feel for their new roles and duties. We're in good hands, folks. And I miss y'all.